So this is Rashida. Um, she is a survivor of the Tula Tolly massacre. Rashida um, had her 28 year sorry, 28 day old baby um, torn from her arms and smashed to death in front of her. Um, they then stabbed her and they tried to slit her throat. Mohammed Ayas is 16. He's the only surviving member of his family. Everyone else was massacred by the Burmese security forces. And he was shot in the chest. You can see the bullet wound there. Fatima is 15. She watched soldiers beat her 10 year old sister to death. And then they beat her unconscious. And she woke up in a burning house and managed to escape. So I think what we want to do as a panel is to explain to you what has led up to this. And, and by that I mean the state crime of genocide that the Myanmar uh, government, the Myanmar military have been engaging in. So I think, um, first I think I'd like to hand over to Azim. The persecution of the Rohingya can be traced back to the Second World War when the Japanese invaded what was at that time British Burma. The Rohingya minority uh, sided with the, the British colonial masters, whereas the majority of Buddhist population decided to support the Japanese invaders. So the persecution of the Rohingya did not start from last month or, or the month before. This has actually been going on for decades. Wave after wave, they've experienced wave after wave of violence. The most recent wave that we're now seeing on our TV screen is probably the worst that we've actually seen. Um, and there's a number of reasons why I believe that has that has transpired. I believe the military believe was in a position that they that they felt that they could execute the final solution. I think if I could hand over to Tom and if you might talk about our, our understanding of genocide. And from studying these genocides we've been able to come up with stages that will signify that a genocidal process has started. And the stages uh, briefly are stigmatization, harassment, isolation, systematic weakening, and then the fifth stage is annihilation, and then you have a sixth stage, symbolic enactment, which is afterwards, how does history remember? So, we went to Rakhine State and started looking for signs of any of these stages, and it quickly became clear that there were signs for at least, lots of signs for at least the first three stages. If we're thinking about annihilation and we're thinking about genocide, the, what they would call the Burmese Rohingya, are almost no more. You know, they are existing in as a diaspora in appalling camp conditions and in other parts of the world. But I think if we're thinking about genocide, what does it look like? What does it mean? This is what it looks like. Um, I wonder if Anastasia and um, Shafi would like to make any comments. I am afraid that um, my work is quite inadequate in this sense. Um, ethnic cleansing does not look like my pictures. It looks a whole lot fucking worse. What's chilling for me is that uh, such a thing could be pre-planned, such a thing could have a chairman uh, who at the behest of the army is telling the population you mustn't go anywhere, you must stay put. We're going to issue you with the NBC cards and you have to have these NBC cards, otherwise you can't go from one place to another. We will charge you if you go from one place to another. So you must stay for the NBC card. And then you realize why, why, why so much effort was put into keeping these people in place and it was to finish them all off. Yeah, Aung San Suu Kyi unfortunately <coughs> has been part of that part of that narrative as well. And just to give you a very, very quick example, one, one very quick example, there was a pamphlet written by Aung San Suu Kyi in the 1980s about her father, who's one of the founding generals of Myanmar. And it's the usual thing, you know, my, I'm, a, you know, I'm very proud of my father and his legacy and so on. But she actually says in that pamphlet that we are proud Buddhist nationalists, not like those Kalar. And Kalar is the equivalent in the US, you'd say the N-word is to use the N-word, or in the UK be to refer to somebody as, as a Paki. Yeah, it's an equivalent word. And this is all a ma matter of public record. We simply choose to ignore it because we like to have our heroes untarnished. She knew what she was signing up for when she became state councillor. She knew that the military would retain control of the three most important ministries in the country, defence, um, borders, and um, the interior home affairs. Uh, she knew all that, and she knew that they, they retained 25% um, of the parliamentary vote. So at this stage, the constitution can't be changed because of that. Very interested to hear what you think is going to happen in the camps, the IDP camps inside Myanmar, and um, presumably there's still hundreds of thousands of people in there uh, who can't get out. What do you think 
it's like there and it's, are they what 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 likely fate is in store for them. Having been inside the ghetto in the capital Sitwe on Mingala, which has seven checkpoints, it was the only Rohingya area that was preserved after the 2012 arson attacks and, and massacres, that those people are sitting ducks. I mean, they must be absolutely terrified, the people in the camps and the people in the ghetto, because um, they are surrounded by an extremely hostile uh, population. And, and I suppose the other point is about those Rohingya still inside Rakhine State, is they've nowhere to go. The, the choice is to go through northern Rakhine State, which the army occupies, and they know what has happened to Rohingya there. They can't go to the water, there's nowhere to go, there's, there's hardly any boats left. They can't go into main side of Burma, so they really don't have anywhere to go.